Saturday morning, this is going to be a fascinating conversation. I'm just going to kick straight off. Um, you've, you know all the panelists. I'm actually going to start with you, Senator Biaggi, and I just want to ask, since we're talking food policy, tell me what your top priority is right now, um, if you could wave a wand, what you'd like to get done, because it's such a vast area. So let's just start. Um, I mean, probably the, the most important thing um, would be that everybody has access to healthy food. So I represent an incredibly diverse district from Westchester County all the way down from Riverdale in the Northwest Bronx, then to the South Bronx, and it includes Hunts Point Food Market. And unfortunately, even though Hunts Point Food Market has the, is the largest food distribution center in the country and arguably in the world, a lot of the people who live outside of those walls don't have access to healthy food. Um, and so I'm thinking about the ways in which we can bridge those gaps and to me that's one of the most important ways because access to healthy food is actually health care. Right. So we're going to talk a bit about that. Um, Assembly Member Crespo, how about you? Um, a lot of the same. We represent uh, much of the Kinda same stir district. Stir it up. Not but the same. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, a long-standing fight to increase uh, our investment in HIPNAP. Uh, we are far, far short of the resources needed to really address uh, what's going on with hunger in, in our state. Yes. Uh, when you're seeing colleges and high schools uh, starting their own food pantries, uh, we, you know we have a serious problem. Uh, the other one is education, and I think I know the last panel kind of touched on this a bit, uh, but as a Latino, like my, my family, we, we show our love through food. Uh, and so the more we feed our kids, that means that we love them. Uh, and that's not healthy when they're giving me a mountain of rice, <laughs> beans, steak, and all the other extra things. And I think a lot of education, I, I've seen some great opportunities to incorporate uh, not only cooking uh, lessons, nutrition lessons, for students and parents alike uh, to make sure that we can teach how to make those same rice and beans with the right portions, with the right ingredients, without adding salt and pepper to the adobo that we're already putting on. Uh, so there's a lot of that that I would like to see more of. And then last thing is just connecting a lot more dots. There's great work being done in this area. I just don't know that we are necessarily, uh, that we're still operating in silos. I don't know that we're necessarily connecting the dots as best we can, uh, but there's certainly a lot of good, good efforts going on policy-wise and in the community. Okay, Councilman Espinel. Um, well, I'm going to stir it up a little bit because honestly, I would say access and education are, are two of the most important things in boroughs like the Bronx and Brooklyn. Uh, but I've also been focusing on uh, increasing access to community gardens, and this ties back to access as well. But these spaces are important to communities, not only in building communities, but also in uh, educating young folks about the importance of growing local food, eating healthier. Uh, and there isn't th enough being done by the city to support these spaces. We're seeing a lot of development, uh, closing down a lot of gardens, and the city should be investing more into expanding that. Great. Councilman Kalos, who, uh, by the way, thank you for the tie on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, first, I just want to... It's honor, an honor to be on this panel, such distinguished colleagues, and thank you. And uh, for those of you in the audience, I'm actually going to encourage you to take out your phones to tweet along with the panel, and uh, everyone who can't actually be here this morning, uh, <laughs> to, to participate in it. And I think for me, it starts and ends with ending hunger. Uh, this is one of the wealthiest cities in America, let alone the entire planet. We have huge wealth disparities in our city. Uh, more than half of the children in our public schools, 1.1 million children we have there, uh, are Title I, free and reduced uh, eligible for lunch. And so one of the things we were able to get was breakfast after the bell, uh, universal school lunch, and I'm really hoping we can get to universal supper and making sure that 1.1 million kids don't need to worry where their next meal is coming from. And along those same lines, we can use information government already has from W-2 pay stubs, 1099 stubs, and taxes when they're filed to actually just give people their SNAP benefits automatically. We can mail it to them in, get, they can get a card right in the mail, and it can say, if you want more, fill out the entire form. Uh, the red states, the conservative states are doing this. Somehow we are not, and uh, there are a lot of families who are going hungry, and I think it comes out to hundreds of millions, if not billions, mm -hmm. in dollars we are losing in this city and so state. That gets to an interesting question, because you hear so much about what's going on in New York City. From a like, just context point of view, are we the gold standard, or are we, far, are we behind on a lot of areas? What would you think? I mean, I think in some ways we are very much ahead of the curve, and in other ways it just it, it's mind-boggling how far behind we are. So ahead of the curve in terms of 
for example, hydroponic farm. So I have DeWitt Clinton High School in my district, and they have a hydroponic farm. What's a hydroponic farm? It's a farm, and I'm sure everybody here knows I that already. I used to think of it as marijuana, but I'm Canadian, <laughs> so shame on me. But yes, now it's I guess you could, do, you could do that. Um, it, th this high school is basically growing all of the produce, not only to feed the high school and the students in the high school, but then they have excess left over, and they are using it to sell to the community. So they're learning to different skills. And what about behind, though? Where are we behind? I mean, access to information about what's healthy standards in nursing homes in terms of like, what, what is a healthy meal? When we talk about things like organic and wholesome, we have not defined what these words even mean. So, so many um, producers of food put these labels on food and everyone's like, oh, healthy or wholesome. It doesn't even mean anything. We don't even have a universal standard. Now, I think that this is one of the areas that is actually bipartisan. It's, it's existential almost. Uh, having yes. The, um, no, okay, anybody else want to say anything in terms of where we are gold standard and where you think we really have I, a long way to go? I, we have a long way to go in a lot of areas, but I got to tell you, I grew up in, in, I went to school in many places, one of them, my hometown in Puerto Rico, where I was uh, born and raised, uh, in Arroyo, and in my town, despite the poverty, mm. our school cafeteria was manned by five incredible women who uh, cooked on site, made um, home fresh meals, and actually, mommy would say, in those days, you could actually leave the school building, come in and out, um, and you had a, a town uniform. So wherever you went, they knew you were cutting class. Uh, but my mom would actually send me uh, to school and tell me during lunch, I'll meet you in the corner, try to get me a plate. That's how famously wow. good the food Not was. Not for meatless and it was, Mondays. And it was home Better. style cooking and it was great. Um, now, granted, obviously that'd be very difficult to scale up in, in a city like this, but I think we need to do a lot more. Uh, in, look, I think we all know, we, there's marketing issues in terms of what is healthy, what isn't. There is a, a uh, funding and resource issue for people to make the best choices possible. Then there's just this lifestyle in New York City. We're all rushing to the next thing. We're running around. I go to so many events, and the fanciest events are the worst because my wife and I leave hungry, and I end up picking up a bag of McDonald's on my way home mm -hmm. um, because I'm starving from the $1,000 plate dinner that somebody invited me to. Um, and, and that's the only thing open late at night for me. Mm -hmm. The city that never sleeps, there is not many options anymore in our neighborhoods for places, even if you're late looking for something. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think at the end of the day, we really have to just target homes and reach families and educate them. Uh, to, this has to be a conversation that parents have with their children, uh, that they're then validating because in schools we're talking about it and, and then uh, that it's matching up with the policies that we're looking to make. Um, I think Ralph hit the nail on the head with farming. Uh, our community gardens are struggling also because even if you give them their space, development around them is cutting off the sunlight. So I think we need to use our rooftops more efficiently and, and encourage that development okay. uh, for rooftop gardens and urban gardening opportunities. Yeah. I, I think I may have the freedom to be the most critical. I would say that New York State might actually be the furthest behind in the nation uh, because out of 50 states, we are the state that had a Republican state Senate literally holding us hostage. And then after Democrats had enough, uh, somehow there was a group of independent Democrats that uh, decided that they would work with the Republicans to stifle innovation here in the state. And you have a huge opportunity that you've never had before in part because of uh, Senator Biagi, who, who took the head off of the IDC, <laughs> and uh, absolutely, right. and uh, between her and Marcos in the Assembly and the Senate, they've done so much in the first year uh, on, on choice, on gun control, on you name it, but now we have the second year of this first term of us actually having a chance to get things done. So I, I would say we're, we're starting from decades if not generations behind but you have an opportunity right now to work with everyone here on this panel tweet us and and instagram us with your ideas so that we can make laws that will support the state that you want to live in where people are healthy yeah. and have and access we to will food. have some questions from the audience too so um you know, one of the things, you raise a good point around sort of the state versus local, and we won't get into Washington because they're not here to represent, you know, us. But I, what would you ask from each other? Like, how can um, Albany be more helpful to New York City and, and even vice versa, you know, because we always look at it as a one way. I'm going to go to you. Yeah, well, there's a, one, one uh, a project I've been working on in my own district, and it's actually improving uh, education around nutrition, but also changing 
the meals within, 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 the, within the schools, right? I work with a great program called Wellness in the Schools, and what they do is they come in, train the kitchen staff how to use the best ingredients, how to make certain ingredients out of scratch, and making sure that they're feeding the children the healthiest options that they so have. So is that a money option? You want more money from? So what I would like to see is that our schools are forced to adopt a, a, a more healthier op mm. uh, food options. You know, our children need to be taught at a young age in order to break that cycle of diabetes, of cardiovascular issues, we have to teach them at a young age that eating healthy is important for the development of, of their brains and, and their bodies. So it's regulation. It's, it's interesting because my dad basically looks at a salad and says rabbit food. So there is that kind of the persuasion versus regulation, the carrot versus the stick. And I was interested, even though it's animal welfare, the foie gras ban, the reaction to that versus, remember, the big soda ban under Bloomberg, where it's like, how dare you tell me that I can't buy a 28-ounce soda and do, what, do with it what I want? What do you think, are, are we erring too much on the side of one versus the other in terms of, you know, education versus regulation? You, you know, you force people and they will then, you know, come to see the benefits of something, food waste or otherwise as well. What do you think? I mean, I, yeah, go ahead, Marcus. It's a combination of things. I mean, look, yeah. some of these policies, while we know the outcome is to achieve certain health uh, uh, indicators, on the other hand, they seem sort of regressive on how they... Uh, uh, impact some communities more than others, and that's where the political challenge, but something, you know, that was mentioned earlier, I, I, despite some of the challenges with the past having Republicans stifling some legislation, I actually confronted a big problem in my own house in the assembly with uh, the former chair of the education committee. Uh, we, as much as we have hunger as a problem and we have nutrition as a problem, we also have a rise in diabetes mm -hmm. and a misinformation that, that somehow diabetics are only those that look a certain way physically. Well, that's not true, and in the Latino community, it is expected that 50% uh, of the children born after the year 2000 will suffer from type 2 diabetes in their life. So we have a serious problem with just health outcomes. And so we passed a bill, uh, this is in the prior majority, uh, to begin to allow schools to uh, uh, keep data regarding uh, the weight of children, not, not with their uh, personal scary. information, but just to manage weight. And, and the reason we wanted that data was not for public consumption, it was for internal use so that we could then manage state dollars and education dollars to address the needs of individual schools. So if there's a, a mm -hmm. bigger problem in this particular district or in this particular school building, allow more resources mm -hmm. to flow there for the programming that's necessary. It's easier to say, just get more money, but where are we gonna get it from? We're facing deficits in, in the budget. So the reality is we gotta be more efficient with what we have, and there's a way to distribute distribute resources to those that need it most so that we can implement good ideas where they're really needed. But we, we need the data in order to, mm -hmm. to figure that out. And, we, and, and actually, the challenge I had is that the, the prior chair of the Education Committee did not like the bill because it used the word obesity, and she thought it was uh, a stigmatizing of children. I said, well, it's a medical term. I, what do you, I'll call it whatever you want. I got the bill done, but I had to agree to an enactment date of 2026, Ooh. which is a problem in terms of implementing good well, policy. So I don't want to make this as much a Republican-Democrat issue as I want to mm -hmm. say that we need synergy on these ideas. The city council does great things. At the state level, we have different challenges dealing with upstate interests and other things. But there's farming communities up there that, are, that, that need us and our markets as well. So we really need to just start working towards one goal. And again, this goes back to connecting those dots of ideas, mm -hmm. making sure that there's synergy between what the council and the state are doing. Mm -hmm. If I can ahead, follow yeah. up on what he said just about implementation, problems. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act was trying to look at how do we get people access to food and SNAP and tying that to Medicaid and child care. And so they made about half a billion dollars available to the state of New York. And is anyone familiar with the system we use to manage our benefits? It's called Welfare Management System. I'm uh, not seeing too many hands going up. It's called WMS. It's about, I think it's older than I am. Uh, and it uses code that is older than I am, and we were supposed to get a quarter billion dollars reimbursed from the federal government to build this system, and it would literally allow us to do the automatic benefits, but for whatever reason, I think, just going back to your question of what could Albany and mm -hmm. the city collaborate on, it would be building out this WMS system, the new version, using, and by now we've actually lost our opportunity to get those federal dollars, but we need to build it anyway so we can actually get the resources we need now and feed people. If I may just also, of course. 
I think I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to just share with everybody that the Bronx is 62 out of 62 for health outcomes. Yeah, the, the Bronx yeah. Borough President it, mentioned and he And the Bronx Borough President has done a lot of work to raise awareness around this, to have initiatives so people get active and are outside and they're walking and riding their bikes. However, it doesn't make sense in a city, again, as wealthy, as... Uh, as uh, influential as New York City to have a, one of its boroughs be at the bottom of the list. And that's not just obesity, that's also highest asthma rates in the country, in the Bronx. And it's all connected because the air that you breathe and the food that you eat is a culmination of your health. And so one of the things I think that we can do, and we don't want any county to be at the bottom of the list, but we certainly don't want one of the five boroughs to be at the bottom of the list. So partnering with the city and having um, real visionary tactics to deal with this is, is, is essential because people are dying of environmental related illnesses every single day. Well, it's interesting, you know, there are a lot of people here from outside New York City, and one of the questions I have is a supply chain question. Mm -hmm. So for example, you know, you've got all of this farming initiatives that are taking place in New York State. How much of that supply chain is actually being connected to the city and how much, um, we talk about private public sector, how much of the policy is oriented toward um, encouraging sort of entrepreneurial energy around this because there's so many <laughs> people that really are trying to make a difference on the ground, how much, um, you know, I'm what is it, nine scariest words, I'm from the government and I'm here to help? Like, that shouldn't be the case, right? So, so tell me a little bit more about um, where that fits on the radar. I mean, I just will begin with saying that this week I met with the Farm Bureau, and one of the things that they are most concerned about um, is the future of farming in New York State. New York has um, distribution of apples and corn, I think, in the top five, as well as dairy. And our dairy production and the dairy farmers are in a situation where people are not consuming as much dairy as they used to. So they're trying to figure out what is their, the future of farming in upstate New York look like and how can we attract other people to want to even join the farming industry. And that really does go to education because if we're teaching kids in schools about math and science and farming and coding, then we're actually giving them the opportunity to choose what type, type of career path they want. And farming should be one of them. And one of the ways to draw that gap and, and to really make a connection between downstate and upstate, which by by the way, there's this like under or like behind the curtain um, rivalry between downstate and upstate that doesn't have to exist is to really make them work together, to take kids from the Bronx and from Queens and from Brooklyn and say, okay, maybe there aren't after school programs or summer programs, but you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna send you to a farm in upstate New York and then you're gonna learn a skill and maybe you won't become a farmer, but now you've just done something different and you're also able to leave your environment and that's a positive thing. So there's, it, this crosses so many needs and there's no reason why we're not doing it. Right, go ahead. I'm the chair of the Contracts Committee in the New York City Council. The City of New York does $17 billion in contracts every single year. And a big portion of that is the Department of Education. And we have 1.1 million uh, mouths to feed breakfast, lunch, hopefully soon, dinner. And we do have a local source uh, reporting mm. that we put up every single year. It's actually a fascinating read, and as the senator said, a lot of what we get from New York State is apples. Mm -hmm. But when you start talking about dairy, that's also an opportunity. Uh, I'm a big fan of Chobani, which is actually made right here mm -hmm. in New York State. Uh, but when it comes to uh, beef, uh, one of the issues is that if New York City were to go to New York to purchase uh, beef, uh, day one, we would be out of cows. Uh, so part of it is trying to scale up local agriculture and then also as a city looking at our contracting and how we can do environmentally sustainable contracting and prioritize uh, local sourced agriculture and places that are within maybe 100 miles or 200 miles versus bringing things from other countries and uh, just how we can do so because right now uh, the government buys whatever is the least expensive. Can I just show, see a show of hands? Who goes into the supermarket and buys whatever is the least expensive? So you have a choice between uh, regular orange juice or you can get the stuff that's concentrate frozen in the freezer section and that's the cheapest. Who goes and buys that? 
Okay, so this is that, a, this is <laughs> I didn't see any hands crowd. go up. We're all but organic. So, We're all so, organic here. We're good. So, so we need to figure out how to do contracting better. Mm -hmm. That's fair. Now, do we have questions? We have time for a few questions. I want to pivot back to some questions. Um, did, I, we have Mike, so just uh, introduce yourself. I see some hands down here. Go ahead. Good, good morning. My name is Charles Plakin, and I want to thank everybody for all they do on the panel. My question is, the, is about uh, policy and creating legislation that would potentially reduce uh, sugar sweetened beverage uh, consumption. Mm -hmm. And we know that from cigarette from cigarettes that taxes have a huge impact. So my question is from the local side and from the state side, is there an appetite to create a sugar sweetened beverage tax? I know we had a debacle wow. uh, you know back with the portion on, cap. Yeah. It's been a long standing issue, hasn't it? I mean I always Washington. say like anything is possible. I'm I'm sitting in the seat that is that's never the probable like, the is it probable? probable, possible, both. It's probable. It's probable because when you raise awareness, like you've just done, and I, this is something that I um, have studied because I'm obsessed with food policy and have been for a long time, but separately from that, um, it is, it's possible, however, however, it becomes more probable when we're all united on that front because what we come up against is special interest. And so the sugar lobby, for lack of better words, is very powerful. And the fact that the first lady was not even able to put on a nutrition label the percentage daily value of sugar we should be consuming every day because the sugar lobby was that powerful, it shows you how powerful the sugar lobby is. But a state like New York that has trailblazed and is in the unique position to be able to lead could do something like that. And since we have a budget deficit, it could actually raise revenue for the state mm -hmm. of New York. Any thoughts? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, can I, I just, uh, if I can just add to that, when the city council proposed a, a healthy Happy Meals and uh, mm -hmm. trying to uh, say you can't have sodas with a Happy Meal, uh, former councilman, now Senator Leroy Comrie, uh, it did not go well for him. The New York Post actually personally targeted him mm -hmm. and went after him and bullied him. Uh, we tried to do the same bill last term and we just couldn't get it done. Uh, there's uh, three, three letters, folks know them as an enemy to our country, the NRA, uh, and there's two versions of them, and, and both of them are, are pretty evil, and uh, it, it's, one of them is the National uh, uh, Restaurants Association, the oh. folks know the other one too. Oh. Uh, but I bet they've we have been some opposing it, but what we were able to do is we looked at it, we looked at social science, and versus saying an outright ban, which folks seem to oppose when we did polling, and we had funding from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. So if you're in a foundation and you heard that question, if you put funding into researching this issue, it can be very helpful. Mm. But what we were able to do is find that if we just said that the default should be healthy beverages, that that was something people didn't have a problem with. And McDonald's, uh, who had previously been targeted by this and has been uh, vilified, actually came and they testified and they said when we switched the default on the Happy Meal, which they actually did a couple of years ago, uh, when they saw this coming, they said that 50% of the Happy Meals that they served to children didn't have sugary beverages anymore. So we found that it, we had social science research, we had uh, oh, doctors default, researching. Yeah. And we switched that default, so one option may be trying to look at uh, defaults. And then another thing that's happening in the Bronx is they've got Teens for Food Justice. Yes. And also, this can happen through the grassroots. The Bronx has something called a Bronx Healthy Beverage Zone. So it actually works better when it comes from the audience, when it comes up from the grassroots, than when it comes from elected officials or, or a billionaire mayor trying to take away your soda. I'll just, I'll just Go add ahead. to that. I'll just add to that, and, and it'll, it has to take laser-focused attention from a grassroots uh, level. You know, unless we have unless we have thousands of people on the streets marching saying that we need this tax, you know, it, it's hard for us as like officials to we carry this We have too many other things to ourselves. march about. So, that's you know, but that's a thing. We, 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 we deal with thousands of issues yeah. every single session, and uh, we, we need the people to stand up and say we want right. to see this tax. Yeah. Well, that's it. It's hard choices, too. Do we have other? Let me see. There's, I know there are many other hands up, so go ahead. I am just can't see anybody. So, um, Hi. I'm Allison Rosenthal, and I'm with the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Mm -hmm. We're one of the largest and most successful um, emergency food providers in New York City. And my question is actually for Ben. I'm happy to hear you're on the um, contract committee. Because um, I'd love for us to take a look at the EFAP contract, the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Mm -hmm. 
Um, this program provides $22 million worth of food for emergency food providers in New York City. However, this contract does not allow for any fresh produce. Um, it is all shelf-stable food items and processed food items. And so you want to ask if it changes sort of thing? So there is a real opportunity mm -hmm. for the city to use existing funding lines to support mm. expanded access for fresh produce and even to support New York State farmers. If okay. you look at the HIPNAP contract. Okay, I'm going to cut you off just a little bit so they can answer just because right, so times are tight. I'd just love to yeah. know how we can work together to shift this. Okay. The okay. answer is yes. I love it. I'm troubled to hear that you're not allowed to serve fresh produce. That's horrible. And uh, if, you, if anyone in this audience is doing work with the city or subcontracts with the city or what have you, hmm. email contracts at bencalos.com. We will work with you to get it done. <laughs> there you go. And he is not running for any, no, I'm just kidding. For, uh, um, as one, we have time for one or two more questions, and then I'm going to have our esteemed panelists sum up. Over here. Hi. Hi, my name is Maria Petruno. I'm a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator. Mm -hmm. And um, my challenge is the Medicaid funding for diabetes education, which encompasses nutrition education. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of talk about nutrition education, but when Health First, as an example of a Medicaid program, is only allowing one hour of diabetes education every six months, you cannot get the education to the patients. Mm -hmm. We're looking on starting cooking classes in our office. I'm in a private practice um, with an endocrinologist, and that's a big challenge for us, is okay. getting the funding for that. How do we move forward with that? Wow. I mean, just like everything else, right? Um, probably won't shock you to hear this. Any group or entity that has a funding request sends a letter about that request to the legislature. Now, one of the best ways to do it is to probably send it to every single member of the legislature at the same exact time. So in the Senate and the Assembly, sending it to all of those members, but especially the chair of the agricultural committees and also the, the health committees and probably also the aging committee as well. Um, and then during budget time, which is every March at the state level, um, we actually do aggregate all of those letters and we go through every single one and we identify where in the budget because we go line item by line item to determine where that could fit in. Now, I have to share this with you because it's very important and I'm um, always compelled to be intellectually honest. Um, last year, so th this is very important, the executive has their own budget and then the legislature has their own budget, right? And each house puts forward a one house budget resolution in March, but the executive comes out with their budget in January. Take a look at the line items for Medicare and Medicaid funding, okay, from this past year, and then look at the preceding year, and then keep your eye out for next year's budget from the executive and also from the legislature, but specifically from the executive with regard to Medicare and Medicaid, because the thing is, the Medicaid and Medicare cuts that are proposed at the beginning of the budget process are part of the reason why it's very hard to make progress in visionary ways, because what happens is we wind up playing catch up in a way that's like, all right, well, if, if there were $500 million dollars worth of Medicare Medicaid funding cut, which was the case last year, but we restored You're it. You're calling for a letter right The, the legislature will buy it back. Right. But then if we buy that back, we can't think of, oh, what's the new thing we need to do with diabetes education? We don't even have the capacity to do it because we don't even have the funds to do it. So what's your action item? To write a letter. Right. So write a letter to and the legislature. Write a letter also to the executive and do it from the organizations that you sit on and don't do it alone. You can do it alone and your voice does matter, but when you do it in an organized way, that that is much more powerful and also scary to some people, and that's good. We it's want a good to thing because people. that's how change happens. And the pressures on those levers are what push them down to make change. Because then we can say, well, look, look at all these people who want this. We have to do this. Right. Fair point. So I'm going to ask each of you to give, uh, it could be a clarion call, it could be a prediction of sort of what's next, what's next on your radar, but give some final thoughts to this audience, you know, around New York City food policy or just generally sort of advice for how they can also engage with you, whatever you want. I'm going to start with you, Ben, or I should say more appropriately, uh, Council Member Kalos. That's, uh, that's what's fine. Your comment? Let's end hunger. Let's make sure that we have nutrition in our schools, that we feed every single child three square meals a day, and let's just give people the benefits they need automatically. We can do it. It's easy. It, it's within grasp. Okay. <laughs> Councilman Espinel. I think we have a long way to go within our schools and making sure that our children are the, are the future healthy adults. Uh, we have to look at how do we transform our school lunches, but also uh, creating more aquaponic classrooms, making them mandatory in every single school so that children can understand the connection between uh, the, the seed they're planting, the food they're creating, and how that's beneficial to their own health in the future. Right. Okay. 
And Assemblymember Crespo? Again, we, we focused uh, on early learning so much academically. Let's do so as well when it comes to changing culture around food and our choices. Um, the biggest changes in my household have been led by my daughters. Uh, they are five and uh, six and, and seven. The, birthdays are coming up, uh, and they have been learning about uh, their health choices. We stopped drinking soda in my household because my five-year-old told me uh, that it was unhealthy and she wow. no longer wanted to see it in the fridge. Um, and when we go to the McDonald's, she makes sure that I only get the milk for her and it has to be the, uh, the low-fat one. So again, uh, it, it, let's get our children to be the next generation of leaders so that uh, we can really implement change. It doesn't only have to be a hammer to the head with legislation. Mm -hmm. We could also just change the culture and, and trends are helping us do that. Great. So that's amazing that you're- Sandra Biagi. <laughs> yeah, that's, hey, you're talking about vegetarian goodness. household for my when kids. When she gets me to stop drinking coffee, then- uh, No, <laughs> that's too far. Okay, Sandra Biagi. I mean, I have to echo what, what all of my colleagues in government have really said. It's about education, it's about access, and but it's also about linking access to healthy food equals health care. Period. It's very simple. When we do that, we make it clearer for many people. And I think a lot of what we talk about a lot of the time is embedded in words that don't really make sense or not accessible. So by just linking it to healthcare, that's, that's I think, one of the best ways we can Great. do it. Please join me in thanking our political colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much for the great questions and enjoy the rest of the event.